asked me, can you please record it? And 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 Jana and 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 Deb um, actually put together slides, so I think it'll be great for for people to see. Um, but yeah, let me. I'm just gonna stop talking now and and turn things over. So um, yeah, take take it away. Uh, which one of you, which one of us would you prefer to go first? Um, I I have no preference. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If you'd like to go, go ahead, Jana. I'll go. Okay. Let me my <laughs> yeah, <screen>. thank you. <laughs> All right. Is that working? Yep. Yep. It's working perfect. Okay. Let me. And I'll just quickly, well, well John, it's getting this set up. Uh, uh, since we, we do want this to be really informal and dialogic, if folks wouldn't mind kind of introducing themselves in the chat, um, that would be wonderful. But uh, yeah, John, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm Jana Hill. I'm the Adult Services Manager for the Fourth Public Library System uh, in uh, today, sunny, breezy Fort Worth, Texas. Um, We've done a little bit of nature programming um, in the past couple of years. I don't know that we did before very much, but I'm a master naturalist here in Texas. So um, I brought that with me and uh, like to insert it into what we're doing. I think it's a, it's a really great opportunity for folks that are moving here, uh, for longtime locals, um, people who need, uh, who wanna get out in nature, wanna get some physical activity, um, great opportunity for all of them. Jana, so, just a quick question. Uh, we're having some people saying they're they're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Um, okay. And you know, maybe just getting closer to the mic. Uh, if that's okay. yeah, that that may fix it. Sorry about that. We'll do. Thanks. I'm also a quiet talker, and our HVAC is very loud. <laughs> so, um, so Fort Worth. Uh, our very long time slogan is "Where the West Begins." One of our early uh, kind of city promoters in the early 20th century came up with that. But it's very, very true. So you can see where Fort Worth is located in a map of Texas. Um, it's a huge city now. We have 920,000 people, um, the, now the 12th largest city in the US. We have between 15 and 30,000 people moving here every year. Um, we have a lot of sprawl. <laughs> so you can see 350 square miles um, and we spill into five counties. 17 library branches, but we'll have two more opening in the next year. Lots of city parks. Um, and then I, I wanted to talk more about the, the cross timbers ecosystem and kind of our climate. So I know Deb is going to be talking about New Hampshire, which probably couldn't be more different from, from here. Um, but the, the cross timbers ecosystem is really, is truly kind of where the West begins. So it's, it's the line in Texas we kind of form the line between the deciduous forest that you picture in the South, in the American South, yeah, um, so and the plains, uh, the Southern plains, so kind of the prairies coming down to the Midwest and then you know transitioning West into desert. So if you're picturing uh, saguaro cactus and rocky outcroppings, very different. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're really right on the line. So right now I'm in downtown Fort Worth. We're in the middle of our county. If I drive five miles to the east uh, where I live, it's a uh, post oak forest. If I drive five miles west, it's a prairie. Um, this armadillo, I mean, you don't get any more Texas than an armadillo. That's really in my front yard last summer. <laughs> so I chased him around with my phone. <laughs> um, summers are very hot here, very, very hot. The nights don't cool off like they do in the desert. So um, while our daytime highs might be 103, our nighttime lows in the summer might be like 87. It's very unpleasant, <laughs> not gonna lie. And then in the winters, I'm sure you've seen some of our ice storms. They make the news, but they're, uh, they're something. Uh, it's not that cold, but it, it can be pretty dramatic. Um, as more people move here um, and climate change increases, um, that, that level of development, so constant building, constant expansion of business and homes and, and all of that are making water conservation and preservation of open spaces um, some pretty big local priorities. So that said, um, this is our first nature program that we did at the very beginning of the pandemic. 
I think this is our first Zoom webinar, so we have a, we didn't get a good recording of it because we frankly did not know what we were doing yet. Um, but this is my friend Sam Kieschnick. He is a Texas Parks and Wildlife Urban, Bio, Urban Wildlife Biologist. So that means um, he's the guy they call when they think they've seen a mountain lion in Dallas, which has happened, but it's very rare. Um, he's also a, the biggest iNaturalist um, advocate probably in the country. He has, uh, as of yesterday, over 92,000 <laughs> identifications on iNaturalist. I mean, he, he lives it, he breathes it. He will come and talk to anyone about iNaturalist. Um, and it was a really great presentation, um, you know, bringing together citizen science, bringing together, you know, really local nature. And while, um, you know, while all of our programs aren't necessarily things you would personally get to, you know, go participate outdoors, they really um, try to spark an interest in, in going outdoors and moving around and being outside in that environment. So definitely look Sam up. If you're on iNaturalist, he is Sam Biology. Uh, you can see lots of stuff there. Just Google him, he's everywhere. <laughs> um, another program we offer, uh, we started offering really early on and continue to do is the Discovery Club Storytime. So I'm, I'm the adult services manager. Um, I manage adult programs and services across the city of Fort Worth. Um, and this is a, clearly a youth program, but I could talk a little bit about it. So um, these are on YouTube. You can watch all of these. Um, they, they have a theme every week. They're really geared for preschoolers. Um, I have a five-year-old. He loves these. Um, it's a really great partnership between the library's system-wide youth services unit and the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge. So that's our largest city park. It's kind of out of the way, um, but it's um, it's been preserved, um, you know, without development. It's not a traditional park. It's uh, it's very undeveloped. And this uh, in the picture here, that's that's Michael, their education director, uh, with a bison skull, and that's Miss Angela, youth librarian. Uh, I think she's singing about bison. <laughs> And uh, the Fort Worth Nature Center happens to have its own herd of bison. So um, it's a really nice tie-in uh, where people can learn about those. They are native to this part of Texas. You don't see them roaming around. They're a special thing. Um, so it's, it's uh, really cool. If you're ever in Fort Worth, come, come check them out. Uh, they are big and hairy. And <laughs> it's hard to believe they were ever just, you know, roaming around where we now have highways and things. Um, we've also partnered with the Botanic Garden in Fort Worth, and they're, they're, um, they have formed kind of a, a partnership. It's more than a partnership. They really merged with the Botanical Research, the Bot Botanical Research Institute of Texas. So that's, um, I mean, it, it, it is what the name says. They, they have a huge um, herbarium. Um, they have this really cool building with a green roof. Uh, they're doing a lot of research there. They're really involved with a lot of uh, local conservation, plants, animals, uh, you name it. Um, but we've had them speak uh, in a number of programs. This is one that we had for Earth Day um, in 2021, uh, talking about the importance of, um, you know, maintaining that, uh, that natural heritage and, uh, you know, the importance of that in, in continued conservation efforts. Uh, they offer some really cool things where um, kind of the citizen science transcription projects where you can go in and transcribe uh, things from their uh, herbarium. Uh, and a lot of them are very local. So it's, it's really cool to see samples of plants that were taken, you know, in the, in the 40s or in the 80s. And, uh, you know, you can look on a map and, and find where they are and, and, you know, contribute to that research and really feel like you're, you've been involved with that conservation effort. We, um, because of the, the urban sprawl and because we do have so many people moving here who, you know, who don't have that kind of generational uh, tie to the area, to our climate, uh, they don't know what a native landscape looks like necessarily. Um, we've done a lot of programming in partnership, particularly with uh, the Native Plant Society of Texas, um, um, presenting on native plants for this area, invasive plants of this area, 
and and you know the importance of native plants in uh, conserving wildlife and um, uh, pollinators and birds and and all of those good things. So here's a really nice quote. Um, Kim Conroe is is the past president of the Native Plant Society of Texas. She also happens to be in my chapter of the Texas Master Naturalists and is just a pal. So she's a really great advocate. She gets people outside and really inspires them to make a difference. And then last summer, uh, we did, uh, speaking of invasive plants, <laughs> we did a paper making with invasive plants program. So uh, this, this lady here on the left in the red dress is uh, an art professor at a local university. And this is, uh, this is really her focus. Uh, she came out and she did uh, some workshops on paper making. She shows how she makes, she has this whole pulping uh, assembly line in her garage. <laughs> um, but she shows how she, she takes invasive plants like privet hedge or, um, oh, what's that? Uh, Ligustrum and some of the other things that that tend to uh, get planted here in Texas, even though they're they're frankly very unwelcome. <laughs> um, she takes them, um, she literally beats them to a pulp, and then makes really cool paper out of them. So these are all papers made out of um, local plants that she gathered at various parks, um, including the one that was in my opening slide. Um, and uh, so I, I love bringing together the art and nature, the getting out, the idea of getting out and hiking around and taking these plants, you know, recognizing these plants, gathering them, and then making art from them. Um, I didn't show the samples of my paper because they were pretty uh, not as good as the, <laughs> the participants, but it was really, really fun. And even though this was quite a hot day because of the water um, you know, involved with paper making, and the shade outside this particular uh, library branch. This is our East Regional Branch. You can't see it, but behind these folks is a is a giant interstate highway. Um, so you know, we just made it work. We found a shady part of the building and we did it. Um, it was fantastic. And then nature journaling is another program we did last summer. Um, we have uh, this is t this is all at Tandy Hills uh, Natural Area on the east side of Fort Worth actually really close to where we were doing the, the paper making. Um, we had a local artist who uh, happens to live across the street from this natural area, who's a huge advocate for, for this particular park because it's a city park. But again, it's a very undeveloped one. They've kept it very wild. Um, it's only about three miles from downtown Fort Worth. So we have your normal skyscraper, you know, skyline and, uh, and and three miles away, we have this this pretty huge pocket of of prairie. Um, they've really tried to um, to maintain it, and in the areas that had been you know over overgrazed and and kind of trampled in the past, they've really done a, a great job of of trying to to bring it back and get it to its uh, former glory. So these are some of our sketchers, and uh, you can see uh, there on the left. That's kind of by the entrance. You can see the cars there parked along the street. On the right, that's a lady sketching with her feet up. Can't beat that. And in the middle is our uh, intrepid group going off to hike and find more places to sketch. Now, the thing about the nature journaling program is that um, it's a Saturday morning. It was only in the 80s, which for us, not very hot. It was in May in the 80s. Um, however, while we were there, I got very, very humid and we had a participant overheat and she, this, you can't really see from here, but it's very hilly where the, it kind of drops off and she, um, lost consciousness from the heat and rolled head over heels down the hill. I had to call the ambulance. I had to call 911 and they had to come in, um, with an off-road stretcher, um, to extract her from the woods and up the hill um, and, and take her to the hospital. So, you know, none of that was expected. And I'm really glad, you know, if anyone was with this group, it was me because I, I do, you know, I am an ex-Girl Scout. I, I am a master naturalist. I've had a lot of experience with, you know, with being outside and I'm a, you know, I'm a mom, you know, you, I, I had first aid kit. I had my phone charged. Um, I'm, I'm glad it wasn't someone else who would panic 
but it did change the way we look at some of our outdoor programming and safety. So uh, that's where we're, we're headed <laughs> from there. So, um, you know, I, I would be very remiss to not have this slide um, in this conversation. So like I said, um, you need to take safety very seriously and respect your climate. So it was about 10 to 15 degrees below what most locals around here would consider hot. Um, yet in the woods where there was no breeze and the, the clouds and the humidity just kind of rolled in, um, it, it felt very hot and um, it, it was surprising. I'm not gonna lie, it was surprising. <laughs> um, so, you know, so respect your climate, respect what your climate can, can do and, um, you know, when you're out and you don't have the option to just hop back into the library building, you know, if you're actually out in the woods, this was about five miles from the nearest library. Um, prepare your participants for that and know their limitations. Um, that particular lady, when that happened, um, oh, she was, she was so, I mean, she was so kind and so gracious, but and very apologetic. She was like, you, you said we'd be hiking. You said to wear sturdy shoes. You said to drink water. I just didn't realize how how it would be um, so you know make sure you're very direct with your participants about the realities of the weather the realities of the terrain um, she didn't know how hilly this was going to be um, and and you know so they can um, they can figure out if that's a good fit for their their personal stamina stamina their personal abilities um, have an emergency plan and know the procedures so when that happened I called, I called the assistant director that I report to and said, okay, I've got all this triage. She's, you know, she's on the, on the way. She's got medical attention. This is all, this is all stabilized. We're okay. What do I do now? Because no one had ever really done offsite programming in this library system. And so it's like, well, what paperwork do I need to fill out? Like, you know, these incident reports for the city, because this wasn't library staff and this wasn't in, a, in one of our facilities. It was on city property because it was a city park, but it's not a library building. Ah! <laughs> so, so now um, having, having gone through that, um, I have instructions um, for anyone who, who takes this kind of thing out into the field because it is a, a very different uh, situation. Um, be sure to refresh your first aid kit. So uh, my first aid kit did not have those little breakable cold packs. Um, this is my personal one. I just bring it with me because I'm like that. And I, you know, and I have a young child. So I always have a first aid kit, but I didn't have those little cold packs. I didn't have, um, you know, like the, uh, uh, what are they called? The um, electrolyte drinks or anything like that. So I've beefed up my personal first aid kit to include those things because that's the reality of being a Texan. You know, we're, we're probably not gonna get frostbite here but, but um, I think everyone who lives here has either um, had issues from the heat or come very close to it. So, so definitely something to keep, keep in mind, especially as you, as you go through different seasons. And then learn to identify your local plants and animals. So I added this because I had a conversation a couple weeks ago with someone who had just moved here from the East Coast. And he mentioned that he was scared to let his dog out at night because of the rattlesnakes. And I said, oh, we, we, don't, we don't really have those here. If you drive an hour west, yeah, maybe. But it's like, if you're living in, in kind of uh, established neighborhoods in Fort Worth, you're not gonna see a rattlesnake. I've, I've lived in Texas all my life. I've seen one and it was in Big Bend. Um, we have scorpions, we have tarantulas, but they're all west of here. But the guy you really have to watch out for, especially if you're out doing that nature journaling kind of thing, is, is shown here and that is our not so friendly copperhead. So uh, copperheads like to be in post oak forests, which is uh, what we have here in Fort Worth. Uh, they like to hide amongst the leaves. They like to eat the cicadas as they emerge from the ground. So um, we have an annual, we have annual cicadas here and they have a constant food source. And um, there's something that I think every remotely outdoor, outdoorsy Texan has come across. So know what's a real threat in your, in your uh, very specific uh, um, locality and what's, what's really something you don't have to worry about so much. 
And it was, you know, the rattlesnakes warn you if you find them. The copperhead just lays there in the leaves, blending in perfectly. Jana, while you're transitioning, let me ask a quick question. We have a few people really interested in those procedures that, that you all developed uh, for, for staff. Um, and uh, I was wondering if, if those may be things that are shareable. Um, and if, if they are, <laughs> I, I'd be more than happy to send them to registrants uh, if, if those are things that you'd be, you'd be comfortable sharing. Because I think others, yeah, it sounds like would be very interested in, in seeing them and seeing if they could adapt them for their own libraries. Yeah, it's so, you know, one result of that, um, this intrepid bee, uh, to, you know, took the people out in the hot woods. Um, after that, you know, we realized because that was, uh, this was all last summer as we were transitioning from, you know, from purely virtual programming, um, you know, kind of back to, back to the old way, but in between we were only doing outdoor programming. So we were doing lots of outdoor story times, big outdoor concerts and things. And it was like, okay, we we need we need a better plan in place because this system just never really did that. And this year we've been forced into doing things outdoors, um, which I I love. I'd much rather be outside than in the meeting room. <laughs> but um, but you know certain things come with that that um, they hadn't thought of. So I'm glad. I mean I hate to say I'm glad it happened to me, but I'm I'm, I'm glad if any you know if it was going to happen to anyone, I, I I have broad shoulders. I I could do this and 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 come up with some new policies or some new procedures to share with the other branch managers. So I, I, I can feel comfortable. Um, so here are some of our programming partners. Um, BRIT is the Botanical Research Institute. That's the one I talked about with the herbarium. Uh, the Fort Worth, Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge is the one that we did, um, that we do those story times with, but we do other programming with them as well. Um, it doesn't hurt that that Michael that you saw with the bison skull uh, happened to be one of the, the folks who trained me to be a master naturalist. <laughs> so, so you know, there's a there's a whole uh, um, personal element in there too. Uh, the Tarrant Regional Water District they supply water, um, you know, to this area, but they provide a lot of water conservation programming. A lot of that is outdoors. Uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. Um, I think in other states they might call it fish and game. Very similar idea. Um, that's where the urban uh, wildlife biologist was from, the Native Plant Society of Texas, um, AgriLife Extension, that's our county extension agent. Um, in Texas, they're all AgriLife Extension. Uh, Rooted In is a local uh, landscaping and kind of native plant, um, plant company. They, they help a lot with water conservation programming through our water department. So that's how we've made that connection. And then the last one is, that's the city of Fort Worth. So because our library is a municipal library, um, we, can, we can tap into city parks. We can tap into the water department. Um, surprisingly enough, code compliance because they handle municipal uh, recycling and solid waste and those kinds of things. So we can do a lot of, um, a lot of conservation oriented programs within the city that, that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of. And then a couple of other partnerships that they're not for programming, um, but here on the left, we have the Wedgwood Garden Club. We have a Wedgwood branch of the library, which is our first uh, branch outside of a central library um, that opened in the 60s. So the Wedgwood Garden Club maintains our landscaping at that particular branch. And it's, if you can read that, they're saying basically uh, they are restoring, they're changing the, the plantings there um, to be more of a mid-century uh, style landscape to match the mid-century style of the building. Um, they've also done a, they just did a program with us this week. Um, and then on the right, uh, the Tarrant County Master Gardeners actually um, built and maintain a native plant demo garden at our Southwest Regional Library. Um, so this photo is taken, I think, from the library looking out at it. So you can't see how it relates to the, to the building, but it's right beside it. It's a really great educational opportunity. They're very visible. They're out there on Saturdays gardening. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's just a, a great opportunity for people to learn um, what native plants look like, where, where they can survive, what they look like you know, together. Um, there's no fee to see it like there would be at the Botanic Garden. Um, it's just a great opportunity. And it's a, it's a great attractor for pollinators and things too. So finding local resources, um, look to your state and local government. So your parks and wildlife, your fish and game, that kind of thing. Your local government being the county. So 
you know, your county gardeners, uh, look to your municipal departments. So look to water, look to parks. Um, reach out to your county extension office. See who, you're, who in your area is really active on iNaturalist. So in my area, that is Sam Biology. <laughs> he is probably the most active person in the country. Um, but you, you know, you can look on there and kind of search by region and see who's popular and see if, or see who's really active and, you know, and see if they want to maybe lead a hike or something. Um, make friends with your local master naturalists and master gardeners. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Um, and most of them volunteer with multiple organizations. So you'll find the master gardeners or, uh, working with the Native Prairies Association, with the Native Plant Society. You see the master naturalists um, working a lot with wildlife uh, rehabilitators and, and that sort of thing. Um, when you're at local art fairs and things, um, Earth Day celebrations, and even entrepreneur events. So I found that um, paper making uh, professor through uh, Global Entrepreneurship Week. <laughs> I was in a networking meeting online and she was saying, hey, I, you know, I do this on this side. Where, where can I market my services? And I was like, uh, to me. <laughs> so you never know where you're gonna find someone. And then check your meet, meet up Facebook and Eventbrite happenings around you for nature oriented events and groups. So, um, you know, if you just Google like nature programs, Fort Worth, you may not, you may not find things like this native prairie uh, program. I think this party for the prairie, that's a native prairies association event. I think that was actually in Houston, um, but I think it's a really good example. You go there pretty much, you know, you throw a rock and hit somebody who wants to come talk to your public about, about these things, because these are all very passionate volunteers. Yeah, and Jana, this may be a good time. Uh, when, as you talk about finding local resources, uh, Christina asked about um, finding uh, spaces that are good for outdoor programming um, mm -hmm. with an eye towards accessibility. So finding finding locations that are really going to be ideal for outdoor programs. Um, and do you have uh, when you when you think about okay, I work at a library and would like to do something outside somewhere in the city. Um, <laughs> is there is there any kind of um, Rubrics or any any mate, yeah. How do you how do you decide where where maybe good spaces to do outdoor programs? Well, uh, I I have two secret weapons. One is personal experience because I don't stay put very much. I go to lots of places. I do. I'm just a, I'm just a busybody. I'm always out exploring and poking around. Um, so a lot of that is you know I'll be I'll be um, taking my family somewhere and I'm like oh this would be a good would be a good programming spot and you know text the rest of the team um but my secret secret weapon is that i have a master naturalist friend who is also um she's a native prairies person but she is one of the planners in our city parks department so all i have to do is is email her across the city and say hey we're thinking about like a program like this where would be some good locations for it? Because if you saw in one of my first slides, we have nearly 300 parks. And even though I go, I'm outside a lot, I haven't been to all 300 parks. And some of those are little pocket parks, you know, in a neighborhood and they're, they're mowed, they're, they're totally scalped. There's no, there's no outdoor nature-y kind of thing to be had there. Um, so it's really hard to tell just from a map, but um, I can always ask her. So I would recommend if you, if you can make friends in your parks department, um, they're all knowing about what's going on, what spaces you have in your city. Yeah, that's great. So tap into the people that, that really, really know. Um, and, and yeah, so this, is, this has been great. Uh, folks, uh, feel free to turn on your mics or if, if people have questions, uh, put them in the chat for Jana. Just to kind of keep things moving, we're at 1.30. Um, I think it would be good to just transition from uh, one of the largest uh, urban areas in the country uh, to New Hampshire, which is anything but. <laughs> and so, yeah, so, so, so Deborah, do you want to take us uh, to, to um, um, your, your thoughts and yeah, take us to New sure. Hampshire? Sorry, I always hit that wrong button. 
<laughs> so my name is Deborah Dutcher and I'm the library services consultant here at the New Hampshire State Library in Concord. And I'll try to keep this as brief as possible to allow for more uh, share time. And my slides will be available um, following this conversation. So you can ac access all the links in the lists um, included here. So I was really happy when Noor um, paired me with uh, uh, Jana from Texas, um, making this conversation about nature from two different, really different regions in our beautiful country, as long as, and as, as well as both of us having two different perspectives. You know, me being from a state library where I work predominantly with the, um, libraries in the state, you know, and she is actually working with uh, people in her community. Um, and um, at most libraries across the nation, um, outdoor programming became even more prevalent during the pandemic as a safe way to gather, and it was no different here in New Hampshire. Uh, in January, um, I held a winter story time share for New Hampshire librarians, which is um, something that I'm willing to share with um, any of you. Um, just uh, send me an email and I can share you my slides and resources. Um, if you happen to be from somewhere where you have a lot of snow like we do. Um, but even snow and cold temps didn't stop the outdoor fun in northern New England. Here we have a couple photos of um, the Cook Memorial Library in Tamworth, New Hampshire, which is more up north in the state. And this is a, uh, the picture on the left is um, Amy Carter, the Youth Services Librarian. I'm doing one of her outdoor story times which I attended one of them. It was a lot of fun. They have a beautiful space out in back of their library. And there's a picture of a um, labyrinth that they had. And even here in, little, in rural New Hampshire, there are libraries that really have little outdoor space. So sometimes you need to bring the nature into you. And something that I'm very fond of, and you can see um, a couple pictures on the right. These are some birds that were that are in my backyard. Um, birds are located everywhere, uh, rural, urban, and they really are a great connector to the outside. Um, you can place feeders outside of your library windows. Um, you know, when it's seasonally appropriate, we are removing them here in New Hampshire because we have bears that like them right now. Um, have identification books and binoculars available. Um, report your birds during um, bird counts, which usually take place in December and February. Um, and you'll, we'll see an example of why this is important in a few slides. Um, you can also take it outside away from the library. Um, some things that are happening here in uh, New Hampshire, New England, are beach story times, whether that be at the ocean or um, beside um, many of the lovely lakes that we have. Um, story times, book clubs, there's kayaking book clubs. Uh, I also have heard from a lot of libraries that are doing field trips to um, local parks and museums. So like most partnerships, we really are better together and um, partnering with your local and state parks, your nature and wildlife departments and organizations such, such as um, extension offices, your Audubon societies um, are a great thing to do. And here are some other lists of why libraries make great nature connectors. And just like John has said, um, is be prepared, um, dress appropriately for the weather, um, set your expectations, um, have a sound to gather up, especially when you have um, groups of children. Um, short outside visits, they're okay. And like I mentioned before, bring the outside in. And I have two um, clickable links here on my slides um, for more outdoor learning tips and um, some tips from the nature clubs for families. So a majority of libraries will be using one of these reading um, programs this summer. And so no matter your manual, um, 
they're both about nature. So this should be a great summer to get outside. Okay, climate change. So some topics that engage adults and teens um, is climate change. Um, and these are some um, ways that you can um, incorporate climate change education. Um, the New Hampshire Fish and Game, um, I have been taking quite a few of their classes over the last uh, few months because um, as I said, um, my working at the state library is a little different and I like to um, kind of preview things before I um, put them out to public librarians. So I've been kind of taking a, a lot of offerings that they have and I'm currently looking to um, have them offer them to directly to the public librarians as a group. Um, but they have a lot of videos and materials about um, the warming water affecting our native fish and um, the current tick problem. Uh, I'm sure that if you um, look at your local um, fish and game or wildlife organizations that they have um, a lot of the same material that you can use um, in your libraries with programming. Here is this, um, I talked about um, bird counts. Here's an example of how climate change is um, affecting the Eastern bluebird population in our state. The, um, if you can see the green is during the summer, the count during the summer. The blue, the blue line is uh, December and then the other one is the um, February. And so you can see that not too long ago, we didn't have the Eastern bluebird here in New Hampshire, but now we do in the winter. And I know because I had at least four pairs at my house all winter long. And I have a link here too for um, resilient communities. Uh, it's a pro programming guide for libraries from ALA on there. And I also, oh, so I think, oh, there's, yeah, there's a picture of one of my bluebirds. <laughs> um, so it's a way that you can entice teens is to become involved is by offering them community service hours. So maybe if they want to um, get involved at your library and some um, citizen science or they call it community science, um, you can give them um, community service hours. I, I don't know what it's like in a lot of states, but I know here in New Hampshire that most high schools require um, community service hours for graduation. So that's something that um, to think about. And it's, it's so much easier to get young children um, committed to preserving um, their environments when they can really make a personal connection in their own backyards. So I, I mentioned citizen science, community science. Uh, we have um, quite a few projects going on. I know again this summer, we had some last summer, um, um, tracking the uh, pollution in some of our, our larger rivers that we have in the state. Um, so it's a great way to get outside and participate in a project and, and contrib contribute the information. And it helps us all learn more about science and how our world works. And on the right, I have a list of um, um, early learning. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to move ahead so fast. <laughs> so, and also there's a, a link at the bottom that you can click on about, uh, you can read more about the benefits of connecting children to the nature from the Natural Learning Initiative um, in North Carolina, with North Carolina State University. But these are all good reasons to get outside. So here's a picture of some nature backpacks that are available at the Goffstown Public Library here in New Hampshire. Um, they have two bags. One we here in New Hampshire, we are fortunate to have. Um, we have the mountains, and we have lots of lakes, and we also have a sea coast. <laughs> so they've put together um, several different bags for um, 
the different regions. And I know that a, a good percentage of our libraries um, in the state um, have backpacks similar to this, and they often will um, pair them with um, a state parks library pass system that we have here. And this slide is more um, a whole bunch of resources that you can look at at your leisure later. Um, here is a recording of a, a really good um, webinar that I attended on how to lead a nature based program without losing your purpose or mind. And there's uh, another um, a web junction program. And then there is a um, video here from our Children's Museum of New Hampshire on um, play based learning and literacy outdoors. And then I put together a list of uh, quite a few of these books I've recently added to um, my collection here because um, I'm getting ready to um, start a whole nature series. And so if you're from New Hampshire um, and interested in these books, <laughs> you'll see me advertising them pretty soon. And here is a couple of free PDFs and a free workbook. And these are some of the um, programs that I have been um, taking part of is the Growing Up Wild and the Below Zero. Um, and like I said, I hope to be offering um, a series for New Hampshire librarians on those as well. Um, and I've, I know that um, state fishing games or wildlife organizations are often the um, people that are facilitating these particular programs. So look into them. Um, in your own state. And then there's a few websites. So a lot of stuff to look at later. <laughs> and so I wanna leave plenty of time for um, questions and um, other people to share. So I know you all have great things coming up this summer. Yeah, thanks uh, Jana and thanks Deb. And, and yeah, this is, uh, we have, some ample time for, for question and answer. So if you have any questions for either Deb or Jana, or if you want to share um, anything you may have done recently or have upcoming for the summer, now now's a great time. Um, so yeah, what, what's on people's minds right now? And I'll, I'll, I'll quickly jump in. So one, one of the most common questions I often get is about uh, weather um, and being prepared for the elements. Um, and uh, <laughs> when, when is weather too rough? Um, and, and I'll just quickly share, I'll try to keep this brief. This came up, uh, I was actually speaking at the North Carolina Recreation and Park Association on partnerships with libraries. Um, and the parks people, they're like, why are librarians so afraid of going outside in bad weather? The like, from a parks perspective, it makes no sense if it's a little bit of drizzle, like they're gonna be out there because they're parks people. And they're like, we do these things with librarians and the librarians cancel because there's a, a chance of inclement weather. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with, with preparation. Like it's not anything we're necessarily prepared for in the way that parks people are. Um, so I'd love uh, any, any insights you have about how we can prepare for the fact that the, the natural universe is, is unpredictable without, um, yeah, having that as something that keeps us away from, from taking things outside, if, if that makes sense, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I can share a little bit. I've been working on, um, I work at the Hickory Public Library in North Carolina, um, and we are in the Piedmont area, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, we have a lot of parks in Hickory and one of our missions is wellness, um, health and wellness. So I wanted to start a program called Hickory Hikers where we go to our local parks and our county and maybe some adventures outside to the mountains. We're only about an hour away from some really beautiful hikes, maybe less. Um, so one of the issues I ran into is uh, we're very connected with our city and the uh, risk management team was not Ha, not we could not do the hiking group basically because we they did not view us as an organization that was prepared to do something like that um so we kind of thought about it and um i reached out to our parks department and um we sat down and had a conversation so one of the things that came up is 
they have an emergency cell phone so that when they go out, they have contact, they have medical training on their staff. So through collaboration, we are now able to do Hickory Hikers because they are the insured organization to handle emergencies, to handle weather, to handle all this kind of stuff. But the library is gonna take a position of education. So we're working on coordinating park rangers. We're working on coordinating birding events and doing stuff like that. That invasive plant idea I thought would be great to add on to the hiking group. So um, partnering through another organization that's designed to handle wildlife emergencies and health emergencies and injuries and stuff like that might be a great way to, to handle something like that. And, and I'm in Illinois and what we have done, I'm a really, really small library. And we had talked at one time about trying to do like um, a bike lending program to get people, um, we're right on the Rock Island Trail here, which is 36 miles of trail. Um, we couldn't do that, but what we did do is we got sponsors to um, put together bike repair stations at the five libraries along the trail. So that got us involved, but then we didn't have all the issues with our insurance um, for actually lending bikes. So. Can I just add an idea? Um, this isn't necessarily related to my experience with libraries, more related to my experience in my community, but we have community campfires. And what's wonderful about community campfires once you get the park permit and the fire department permit and your local health department might require a permit uh, since we're still in, in COVID. But um, after you do all that, campfires um, are kind of magical. They really break down barriers between groups of people who may not otherwise connect with one another. And as you're standing around that campfire or roasting a marshmallow, um, what happens is you start talking to that person and uh, relationships grow from there. So I'd heartily encourage you uh, to think about doing campfires. And there's nothing better than stories or singing around a campfire as well. We do it with all ages. Uh, we get a great um, turnout from our community. Recently, we've been doing them monthly and I'm from Calgary, Alberta. We did have to cancel one this year because it was really, really cold. But if it's only moderately cold, we go ahead and have them. So that's my tip. Um, also, we bought um, smokeless or low smoke fire pits. They're a little more expensive, but uh, people don't like going home with smoky clothes or they don't like smoke in their eyes. And um, truly those smokeless fire pits are um, effective. They, they really work. So I'd encourage you to look at those too. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Christina Gomez. I'm a community engagement librarian at Madison Public Library in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, this has been such a great presentation. So thank you to our presenters. Um, I wanted to add a new initiative we're starting here at Madison Public Library. It's a naturalist in residence um, initiative. Uh, we currently have the call out right now for submissions with the goal of working collaboratively with a local naturalist and actually using a very broad definition of naturalist um, and like co-producing, co-creating a series of events um, sometime between July and September, and they'll be compensated both for their time and planning, but also for the programming itself. And I'm really, really excited about it. And I'd love to hear if anyone else has pursued that model before. Here at Madison Public Library, we've used residencies with artists. So artist residency, we had a Native American storyteller residency. So we're, um, we, we're really good at this particular residency model, but this will be the first time we're um, you know, using this alongside a naturalist. I'm also specifically interested in um, this type of programming, looking at looking at it with a lens of equity and diversity and who feels welcome in outdoor spaces, who has traditionally been excluded in outdoor spaces. Um, so that's something that we'll be looking at um, 
with the proposals we receive and being very thoughtful when crafting the programming in terms of location and, and target audience. So um, I just wanted to share that. And again, thank you to the presenters. I had a lot of great notes I took <laughs> from your from your talks. Here, here in Texas, um, the, the Texas Master Naturalist Program is largely, I guess, operated by Texas Parks and Wildlife. And if you look, um, they have um, natural, I think it's called like Na Texas Master Naturalist Tuesdays, where they have a, a webinar during the lunch hour on Tuesday. Um, and there have been some really, really good ones about equity and diversity in um, in the natural world and um, outdoor programming, they, I've been very impressed. So I've, I'll um, I'll look them up and see if I can find them real quick. But if I can't, go Google them because they're really good. Yeah, thank you. And, and Vivian, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to share. So um, I know you mentioned something about partnering with like. Um, local governments and, and uh, community groups. So what we did is we, uh, I'm from Los Angeles Public Library and we actually partner with the, the city's LA, um, the Sanitation and Environment Department to host a bio blitz last summer um, our, and with a very specific goal to help the, the researchers, uh, the biodiversity researchers with their biodiversity index updates. So um, we, we basically tailor our bio blitz, um, specifically asking people go out looking for the indicator species, which there were 39 of them. And then um, we also work with, with the researcher to find out where are what we call the observation cult spots in the city, in the communities. So we, using those two, basically people were able to learn some really interesting, maybe these more uh, professional terms, what those are. And um, we had really, really good turnout. And we also use iNaturalist for that. And because of the, that model worked really well for us. So this Earth Day, we're gonna do a one day bio blitz again. And um, it will be a, a, also in another um, bio, I mean, the observation coast spot that um, we're gonna to try to get people to go there and then try to see if we can find some interesting bugs and plants over there. So that's one thing we did. And because of that connection, now we're roped in to work with the, um, the cities, uh, City's Office of Sustainability. Now we're also working with them on the air quality sensor program. Um, we started with um, knocking the door at EPA, which they really, um, you know, they, they did a great job taking us in. They even apply a, a grant on our behalf to help us get some um, really cheap, well, not cheap, actually very reasonable priced um, air quality sensor along with a phone. So we, we started a loan program in our library now. And so it's focusing on air quality sensing program uh, education. So we've been expending a lot of stuff. So that's one of the things we're doing. We're also partnering with the National Park Services that um, they, at, at the Santa Monica Mountains, that they are actually creating these videos. And now we're doing the um, sort of like a, online kind of viewing party. And then we invite them to come and do a talk for us or do a Q&A afterwards. And we'll be launching that as part of our Earth Day celebration. So there's a lot of ways to partner with these people. I know sometimes you might think EPA is not really going to respond to your email, but I call email them. I did wait for three and a half months before they email me, but they did <laughs> respond. And so now they work really closely with us and they are looking to expand their loan programs with other um, in other regions. So if you are interested in doing that, definitely email them. Um, they each regions have their own contact. They would love to hear from you. They really want to expand into libraries. Yeah, and I, I just want to reiterate what Vivian said. And, and I always uh, tell people the worst that anyone can tell you is no. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and, and, it's, and, and when you think about agencies, not only local, state, even national, um, and, and I agree with Vivian, I think uh, a lot of these agencies are looking for uh, folks like librarians to reach out to them. They may not naturally think of librarians as partners, but they, they, they often are, oh yeah, I hadn't thought of libraries, but that sounds great. Let's work together. Yeah. 
And I know we mentioned about inclusion and diversity. Mm -hmm. So um, for us, because we're in LA, we're very diverse in terms of the community. So we do have, a, we're, we're, we're really fortunate. We have librarians with different language skills, but um, typically we try to make sure most of our materials and stuff are translated into different languages to cover uh, different communities and cater to different um, ethnic groups. And um, I don't know if you know, but iNaturalists actually have a, a group in Chinese. So if you are ever, you have someone who has the interest in doing that or a volunteer who speak Mandarin, you can have them reach out to me. I can definitely help guiding them and helping them with the translation stuff because I'm working on translating stuff for them right now, so. Yeah, and I, I see Lynn, Lynn uh, is talking about cleanup days. Um, and and J Jana, you mentioned about kind of having groups kind of volunteer to, to I don't know, keep the, the green spaces looking looking good. Um, and, and Deb, you mentioned kind of teenagers volunteering service hours. Um, and I'd love uh, if, if you or anyone else has any thoughts about um, how to most effectively kind of um, tap into uh, people's desires to be uh, active stewards um, of green spaces or the environment more generally, if you have any, any thoughts about what may work uh, to, to help do that. Um, yeah, so I, I had made a comment in the chat that I can at least, I'm, I'm not a master gardener, I'm a master naturalist, um, but um, both of those groups um, in, in Texas, and I'm assuming probably across the country, require ongoing continuing education hours and ongoing volunteer hours. So um, I can tell you I'm always on the lookout for ways to get in my hours um, in ways that that work with um, you know my schedule because I work with, I'm, I work full time, I have a child, I have lots of things going on. I may not be able to go garden on a Thursday afternoon. <laughs> you know it's just that's not going to fit in my life. So um, so those groups are always looking for for um, all kinds of volunteer opportunities that, that will meet the wide variety of needs of their, of their members. Um, so I would, you know, you, you might know members, but the, the way to get in is, is, you know, look them up, find who their volunteer coordinator is, and try to get on their, their roster of like pre-approved uh, volunteer opportunities. Um, market your, pro your, your more, um, luxury kinds of programs to them. Um, I, I do that, it works really well. They get credit for attending our, you know, water conservation gardening programs. Uh, it's, a, it's a really great relationship um, and very easy to tap into. Yeah, thanks, Jana. And, and I think uh, everyone is leaving the day with a lot of great uh, thoughts of organizations to reach out to and, and partners that we could use. Um, and so we are at two o'clock. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Jana and Deborah for leading today's conversation and thanks everyone for coming. Um, and uh, let's let's continue the conversation. Um, I'm really <laughs> hoping we can keep having having these uh, going forward. Um, and so um, yeah, let's let's keep talking and sharing and, and building this up. So appreciate everyone's time um, and, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone.